Okay, so good evening, everybody. For those of you who aren't familiar with me, my name is Bob Bruner. I am the exotic forest pest educator with the Department of Entomology on Purdue's main campus. Um, I have a lot of hats that I wear. I primarily specialize in invasive species, uh, particularly those that involve where uh, residents meet forestry. So a lot of urban forestry is where I usually do a lot of my work. Um, most often you'll hear me talking about spotted lanternfly or similar insects that are hitting trees or could potentially begin hitting trees in the state of Indiana. But tonight, I am taking a bit of a different turn, and instead of telling you all about an invasive, I'm going to be telling you all about a native. So in a lot of the talks that I have, when I, especially when I talk about spotted lanternfly, I compare them to cicadas. And this year is a particularly interesting year because we are going to be experiencing a double emergence of different cicada broods. Um, I'm going to kind of explain what a cicada actually is, where they come from, what they do, and then give you an idea of what it means when I use the word brood. Um, you may have questions like, is this going to look a lot like how uh, Brood X did when it came up? Uh, short answer, no, it won't look quite like that. Um, probably not nearly as many cicadas, but there are a lot of interesting facts about this uh, that you may not yet know. So why don't we go ahead and dive in here and, of course, ask our first question, where do these come from? So those of you who grew up in the Midwest, you already know where they come from. They are native here. Uh, we deal with cicadas every year. We have several different species of cicadas, but they're primarily divvied up into two different types. Uh, one of those types are annuals, and one of those types are periodical cicadas. And the ones that we see the, all the news about the big broods emerging are our periodical cicadas. Now, this being said, um, the United States is not the only place in the world that experiences cicadas. These are actually a very, very cosmopolitan insect. They occur in many, many parts of the world. And really, you're going to find them wherever you can find deciduous trees. Those are their primary host plants. They're going to be what they occupy themselves the most with and where they're going to reproduce. Um, cicadas have actually kind of built themselves up into a lot of cultural history. You can find all kinds of artwork involving cicadas, jewelry. Uh, they're a part of stories and fables. And those of us here in the U.S. are definitely not an exception to that. We are probably one of the few places in the world where we actually confuse cicadas with something else. Mainly because we ask the question, are locusts and cicadas the same thing? So when I was growing up, it was very, very typical to hear people refer to a cicada as a locust. Hmm, excuse me. So, and this is something that still goes on today, too. A lot of people will still refer to cicadas as locusts. Now, this probably came about because when settlers were originally colonizing the continental United States, they would experience these large emergences of cicadas that would kind of sweep over everything. And this would kind of probably force them to draw parallels between different stories about locusts swarming over crops and consuming them. But in reality, a locust is actually something that's more closely related to a grasshopper. So if you've ever been to Africa, there is a type of uh, kind of grasshoppery insect that is a literal locust that will create a giant swarm and sweep over crops. Or if you are from the American Southwest, particularly Utah, you might be familiar with the Jerusalem cricket, which sometimes is also referred to as a locust and does a similar thing. However, our cicadas, they are not locusts. They don't consume crops. They don't really do a whole lot of damage in that sense, especially not compared to what an actual locust would do. But the question, of course, comes up, what actually is a cicada? What does it actually do? So to answer this question, we first need to understand, you know, what portion of the insect world do these things come from? And if you've been to my programs, you've heard me refer to them being related to uh, spotted lanternflies, aphids, and things like that. These cicadas are a part of a group that is called, referred to as the true bugs, an order of insects called hemiptera. This is a very, very large order of insects. It has a lot of different members to it. Um, some entomologists have theorized that it might actually rival beetles in numbers of types of species that it has. 
But what really comes down to is that they all share one very common trait. Every member of Order Hemiptera has mouth parts that are shaped like a syringe. Uh, we entomologists may refer to them as piercing, sucking mouth parts. And what they do is that they will put these mouth parts into plant tissue and drain out the nutritious sap that can be found in the phloem tissue of a plant. Um, this means that they are kind of a grazing insect. They are herbivores, of course. So they're going to drain out that sap. They're going to do so slowly. And they're just going to kind of hang out on whatever trees they like to hang out on. Uh, one of the big behaviors you may also notice is that they're going to be singing while they do so, or at least the males will. And I'm going to talk about that a little more later on. So why don't we get into... Oops, I almost got ahead of myself there. So I did mention cicadas use deciduous trees as their host plants. They don't really feed on many other woody plants. Uh, they typically like to stick to those trees, and they will keep going back to those trees year after year. Uh, while they're capable of doing a decent amount of damage to them, uh, the damage they do isn't really that bad. Uh, during some years where there are a lot of cicadas, the damage, you may see some branches start to flag, droop as, the, as they start taking a little bit more of a hit from them especially as they lay their eggs. They'll lay their eggs in the actual woody tissue itself. Um, but overall, trees recover from them pretty well. They aren't a major concern when it comes to trying to decide whether or not we need a treatment plan. And then the nymphs themselves, they also feed on those same trees, except they're going to be underground. They're going to feed on the root systems. So they don't have a, a what's called complete metamorphosis. They have nymphs. They don't have a caterpillar that's going to grow. And let, why don't we get into the life history so you have a good idea of what this is going to look like. So a little on their life cycle. We're going to start from the top. And we're going to start with the eggs of this insect. And right here, you're seeing Dr. John Overmeyer, an entomologist and photographer with Purdue's Department of Entomology, who provided all these pictures for me. Um, he's showing you where the eggs are laid when a cicada lays its eggs. What they'll do is that a female will use an organ on the rear end of her body that's referred to as an ovipositor. And she will cut a rut with that organ. It's basically think of like a very, very sharp pointy thing coming off her back end. She'll cut a rut into softer twigs, laying the eggs into the ruts that she's now cut. And you can actually go and check this out this season as these cicadas arrive. And you will see that behavior going on uh, and you will be able to see the eggs. You may need a hand lens to be able to see them depending on uh, the size of the cicada itself. Now the eggs are gonna hang out in that spot for about six to eight weeks developing. And that's going to be dependent on the temperature as well. So the warmer it is, you can expect them to develop faster. But if it stays cooler, it may take them longer. The eggs are going to hatch out into those first instar nymphs, instar being the time in between molts before they are an adult. And those little nymphs, they're going to fall to the ground and they're going to go ahead and burrow into the soil. And that's where they're going to hang out for a period of time until they decide that they're ready to become adults. Now, that period of time is going to vary by species. And as you're going to see, it's going to vary quite a bit. Now, the nymphal stage. So I mentioned these guys don't have a caterpillar. What they have is a nymph. It look, it, think of a smaller version of the adult that is wingless. Now, the nymphs are really interesting because unlike the adults, their forelegs are very thick and they're built for digging, which is how they burrow into the ground and how they locate their food into the ground. They dig towards plant root systems and they will just start feeding on them. Now, again, while they can feed on tree roots, they don't seem to do so with enough activity to actually cause a lot of damage to the tree. So, I mean, most likely you've got any number of nymphal cicadas on your property right now that are just feeding on tree roots and have been for literally years. Um, now, the amount of time I mentioned can vary by species. So our annual cicadas, technically they're not actually annuals. They're more like species that take about two to five years underground. We just happen to have enough groups of them that we see them come up every year. However, there are some groups of them that will take 13 years to feed and complete that life cycle where they come out of the ground and become adults, or up to 17 years. This year, we have a group of 13 and a group of 17 years that are coming up at the same time. So, the adult stage. The adult stage is kind of interesting, too, in that how they become adults when they actually go ahead and emerge. 
And this is one of the ways you can actually look and see that you have cicadas that are coming up out of the ground on your property. That way you know that they're coming even if you can't hear them yet. One of the easiest things to look for is an emergence hole. Uh, these will look like a roughly pencil-sized hole in the ground. So you could probably easily stick a number two pencil in that hole. It may even be a little bit bigger than that. Sometimes these holes may even have a little bit of a kind of soil-like chimney coming out of them. Uh, where they basically push the dirt to the sides and it kind of makes this little chimney as they come out of the ground. Um, usually those holes are going to be by trees that they've invested before. They know that that is a successful place to uh, reproduce. They know they can get food there. So the young are going to take advantage of those same spots year after year. This is when the instar has now entered its fifth molt and is very close to becoming an adult. Now, once they do so, they're going to climb up on nearby vegetation, on the sides of buildings, on anything you can imagine. So that way they can then hatch out of their larval stage and actually begin to spread their wings as adult cicadas. This is where you see those cicada shells appear. That's the remnants of their final exoskeleton as a nymphal cicada. Uh, they, unfortunately, some years they are everywhere because sometimes we have big emergences. You remember back in 2021, you practically couldn't go anywhere without running into one of these things. Um, but again, I do want to emphasize that all cicadas do this. They are present year after year. Some years we just happen to have more of them. Now, once the adults hatch out, they need time to dry. So they're going to hang out on the side of a plant or a side of a tree. So that way they can dry. Their exoskeleton will harden. Their wings will be able to fully unfurl and fill in. And then once they're big enough, they will go ahead and buzz over to a nearby branch and begin to do what the adults do. They'll begin to call for mates, they'll begin to feed, and eventually mate and lay eggs. See, I see a question in the chat, xylem versus phloem, which the cicada bugs feed on, which is the difference? You said fluid, nutritious. Uh, so what they are doing there is they are trying to get to the plant sap. And they will reach into xylem and phloem cells. Now, xylem cells usually carry mostly water throughout the plant, whereas phloem will normally carry nutritious components of that sap through the plant. The bugs don't really discriminate. They're just trying to find that nutritious bit there, and they'll pierce through all those cells until they can finally find a spot where there's that nutritious sap and then drink it out of the plant itself. That I hope that answers your question. All right, so I'm just going to keep moving here. This is going to be over a little bit quicker than I planned. So with our adult cicadas, they're going to be about an inch in length. They're going to have these large wedge-shaped bodies, and they're going to have wings that'll sit on the surface of their body, kind of like a roof. So let me go back to that previous image that I just showed you. You can see the wings of these new adults are kind of sitting there in this great little roof shape. That's a trait that's shared by a lot of members of this uh, kind of order of insects, not just cicadas. And it's an easy way to tell what you're looking at. Now, cicadas do buzz around. They do fly. But unfortunately, they're just just—they're not very good at flying. Uh, if you've ever been in a big cicada emergence, you probably notice that they tend to bounce off of everything. They'll bounce off your house. They may bounce off of you as you walk outside. Um, but they're good to... They're good at hanging on to objects. So, so they're basically, they're good at hanging on to the trees that they're going to be feeding and reproducing on. So I see a question there too. What is their use to the environment? Well, they're herbivores. So they are feeding on plants. Um, they provide food for birds. Um, and they're just, you know, they're part of our natural ecosystem here in Indiana and other Midwestern and Eastern states. All right, so one of the things that cicadas are really, really well known for is their singing behavior. Now, this is something that if you've been in Indiana for any amount of time, you are very, very familiar with cicadas singing in a certain part of the summer. Um, what this is, is that these are male cicadas. They are calling for mates to come and find them. And they can get very, very loud depending on how many cicadas you're looking at. In 2021, when we had our big brood X emergence, uh, it was deafening. Uh, my my wife sometimes jokingly refers to it as the trees are screaming again this year. Um, and we will experience that again this year. This is something that I actually kind of look forward to. I love the sound of cicadas myself. Um, but some people I know, it does drive them a little bit crazy. 
see, I see another question. Is there any one species of bird that likes to eat them? Not to my knowledge. I think that birds are going to pretty well go after them no matter what. They don't have a, any particular bitter taste or anything that I'm conscious of. So most likely birds and small mammals are going to go after and eat them. And depending on the year too, that may become a primary food source for them because there could be so many cicadas available to them as prey. So I've referenced this a little bit already this evening, the idea of annual versus periodical cicadas. And this is actually a little bit important. So that way you have an idea of what that difference is. Um, so annual cicadas are going to look different than the periodical. And all the images you've seen here so far, these are all periodical cicadas you're seeing in these pictures. Annual cicadas are going to ha have a green color over most of their body. Their eyes are probably going to be black, but there may be some variation there. Their wings won't have that noted orange color to them. They're going to have just black veining on them. Um, they will stand out very obviously against the backdrop of a periodical cicada emergence. So I described that a little bit there. Also, our annual cicadas, usually they lead about a two to five year life cycle, depending on species and where they are. Um, however, we just have so many groups of them that you know, we see them every year, year after year. Another thing to note about annual cicadas as well is that they don't do mass emergences. They will come up when they come up towards the end of summer. Um, they'll feed for a while, sing, and then eventually die off as they repeat their life cycle. So I got a couple of questions here I want to cover before I move on. So are there any specific species of trees that they prefer to feed on during the root feeding stage? Uh, generally, they're just going to go after the nearest tree that they can get to. Um, there are a few theories as to what they will do there. One of them is this concept of habitat selection, where the adult has been successful on a tree. Therefore, its young will be successful on the same tree because the adult found it too. Um, I would guess most likely that wherever their egg was laid, they're going to fall to the ground. They're going to burrow in, and that's the tree that they're going to be feeding on. There isn't any one species of tree they go after. They will go after pretty much any of them. Um, and it's in, in one way you can actually see that is if you have a property that has a lot of trees on it, go and see where the emergence holes are this year and see which trees they're around. You'll probably find there are lots of different ones that they will go ahead and feed on. Then I see another question, why 17 years? What kind of advantage is that? So what you're looking at there is a combination of most, and this is me theorizing, I should say, <laughs> excuse me, is a combination of a couple different things. So by varying the year that they come back up and creating that distance as opposed to coming up year after year, they're hedging their bet that their young will come up during a period of time where they're, they're not uh, fighting for resources as much. They're not going to be competing against another brood of cicadas. So that way they can stagger each other and not all be in competition with one another. However, the number 17 does seem a little odd, right? That's a little bit of a large gap. Uh, the reason for that is, is evolution is not smart. Um, what happens is that the ones that are successful will carry those traits forward to the next generation. And then that trait will be focused on as they reproduce. You know, the most successful ones will have this particular trait where they'll be able to stay in the ground longer. And it just kept developing that way as mates were chosen based on those traits. And it just kind of got stretched out that way. Uh, again, that is me theorizing, though we do see that occur many, many times over in nature with different traits. Let's see. So do you know if they pose a danger to dogs and the obvious choking? Um, she seemed fine, but it was concerning. So I think cicadas do have a mild bitter taste when it comes to, say, your dog eating them. I do not myself know of any issues. I have dogs myself and they've consumed them. However, I should also caveat that I am not a vet. This is a conversation you probably want to have with them just to be sure, but I think you're safe. And then, Kathy, I see you asking, do they all emerge about the same time? Yes. So that is a really interesting question. That's going to lead me into my next spot here, because that actually takes us right into talking about our periodical cicadas. But I'm going to cover these the next slide I've got here, so that way I can move on. Um, so a little bit more about our annual cicadas. So we hear these referred to as dog day cicadas because they come up in the dog days of summer. They come up in the latter half of the summer when it's just really hot. The days are long. Um, and of course, 
these guys, just like any other cicada, they're going to attack woody plants. They don't cause enough damage to warrant any kind of treatment or mitigation. These, again, these are our annual cicadas, the ones that we get every year. They are also uh, the favorite prey of a type of wasp. You've probably heard of the cicada killer wasp. Um, pardon. So the cicada killer wasp is a type of wasp that will inject a paralytic venom into a cicada and then carry it back to its nest so their young can feed on that cicada. Uh, cicada killer wasps are very large. They're kind of scary looking, but they're generally harmless to people. And if you are watchful in any given summer, you may see actually see a, one of them carrying a cicada off to its nest. And it's, it's really interesting to see, at least from the point of view of an entomologist. Now, getting back to the question that was asked there, do they all emerge at the same time? Periodical cicadas will. Annual cicadas will not. They will emerge when they emerge. They do not have a mass emergence. However, all of our periodical cicada broods will emerge all at once. That's why it just becomes so deafening and why there are so many cicadas all at once, because they quite literally all came up at the same time. It's a quirk of their biology that they will do this based on a set of stimuli that includes temperature and some way their own internal clock will inform them that it's time to come up. It's fascinating to watch. You can see this with other insects too, where you see mayflies all will emerge and hatch out as adults out of water at the same time. Um, I do not have the particular knowledge necessary to fully explain that mechanism, but it is, it's just fascinating to me. So we had another question underneath that. How do you know there will be more than normal numbers this summer? Well, that is actually an interesting question. And again, that leads us into our next part here. So you have probably heard me already this evening and in the news heard people refer to cicada broods. Everybody's talking about them. And in 2021, we were telling you all about brood X cicadas. And when they came up, we had all these huge number of cicadas everywhere. So what is a brood then? So a brood is a group of cicadas of the same life cycle type, i.e. they're either all 13 year or 17 year, and they will all emerge concurrently in the same year in the same region. So imagine a brood is just a group of cicadas that share the same life cycle, that live in the same place, that all come up at once together. So we have, this is so exact that we've been able to separate them out and actually label these broods. Um, and we've actually traced it now. There's a fascinating paper written by Dr. Cliff Sadoff, who's now retired, um, who uh, he labeled all the different, or he talked about all the different broods that we have and um, also pointed out that we've actually lost some broods too. Uh, some of our broods have gone extinct now. Um, what's really fascinating is that broods also do not represent the exact same species or families or even re close relations they are just sharing a similar life cycle pattern. Uh, and keep in mind, when we talk about periodical cicadas, we are talking about cicadas that all belong to the genus Magus cicada, but not necessarily the same species. So that's just kind of fascinating. It means that we have multiple species that are all behaving in the exact same way at the exact same time and have apparently adapted to the same way of living without being the same species. To an entomologist, that's just, that's, Absolutely fascinating. Now, I see there, someone is pointing out, I've seen maps that show a huge number expected in Illinois, but not in Indiana. Why is that? That's what I'm actually getting to right now. You can go from region to region and find a brood active at any given point, but those broods are restricted to their own regions. They don't go beyond them, really. So that means that brood 13 and brood 19, which are the two big groups that are coming up this year, their geographical region is more associated with Illinois with parts of it coming into Indiana as opposed to it being more over here. So what you're seeing are the edges of larger groups that are really more coming up in Illinois. But what's really funny too is that those two geographical regions of those two broods, they actually don't really overlap much. Um, I was reading a paper the other day that was talking about how you can actually drive from Northern Illinois, you know, be experiencing one brood, and drive straight into southern Illinois and move into the territory of another brood, but you might not notice a whole lot more cicadas because those geographical regions those broods occupy don't really overlap. Um, 
So that's why you may see those maps that are demonstrating different things about where those broods will happen. And I've actually got a spot in here where I tell you where they're going to be occurring here in Indiana. Let me get to that. So first off, though, what I want to do to give you a little bit of backdrop is I want to talk about the Brood X emergence. So for those of you uh, who remember, I hope you all remember, um, back in 2021, we had Brood X emerge. What happened was we got a whole lot of cicadas all happening all at once all over the state. So what this is, is that we had one massive brood of cicadas all come up at the same time all over the state. They were widespread. Uh, there were very few places in Indiana that did not experience quite a few cicadas. It was obscenely loud for that year. Um, and of course, that just added to our pandemic woes where we go out, we could we had to isolate. Now, every time we went outside, the trees were screaming, as my wife would joke. Uh, what's fascinating is I'm actually at a unique point at my age. So I'm able to remember when one of the broods came up when I first started as a student at Purdue. And then working in Purdue Extension as an adult, I saw Brood X come up. So it, this is why this is such a great subject to me, because it's really one of those milestone moments I get to enjoy. We will see Brood X again, too. So they will arrive again in 2038 when my son will be about 15 years old. And I'm really looking forward to being able to share that experience with him once he's old enough. So keep in mind, like I was saying, though, this brood was all over. It's a huge brood. It covered the entirety of Indiana almost. However, brood 13 and brood 19 are not going to follow the same playbook. They're not just going to spread all over the state, cover everywhere. What's fascinating about them, the reason it's occurring so much in the news right now is because what you have are two concurrent emergence events that have not happened together for over 200 years. These two groups haven't come up together since Thomas Jefferson was president of the United States. Um, but that's kind of the news media making a big thing of something that really might not be as big a thing as you think it is. Uh, the emergence won't be widespread, just as somebody was pointing out there where we're going to see a lot of them in Illinois. But really in Indiana, what we're going to see is that if you live on the western side of the state, so we expect about eight western counties from Posey and Warwick in the south up to Newton and Jasper in the north is going to get brood 19 emerging. And then concurrently in Lake Porter and LaPorte counties, they're going to have brood 13 emerge concurrently. So that tells a whole different story, doesn't it? So where I am right now, I live in Terre Haute, which means I'm in Vigo County. So I expect I will see some additional cicadas this year. Not really a whole lot to write home about. They're going to be more, sure. And it's going to be a little louder, but nothing really gigantic like brood X emergence. And this is going to be true across the westernmost counties of the state, with some counties in the north portion of the state. This is one of those events where the news media has kind of made a thing out of nothing, unfortunately. It is fascinating, though, because this hasn't occurred like this for over 200 years. And we are not going to see it again within our lifetime. So let's get to where and when are they going to show up? You know, what can we expect knowing this information now? So periodical cicadas, they're going to emerge in the early spring. So this means that they could quite literally appear any day now. Uh, I would expect that as we get a little bit warmer here within the next two to three weeks, we're going to see them start to emerge. Uh, we, are, we are already warmer than probably what it would be expected right now. We're in an El Nino system right now, so uh, most likely we're going to see them sooner rather than later. Um, you can look for emergence holes at the base of your deciduous trees to see if they've come out yet. And you can pretty well bet that if they have hit a tree in the past, they will do so again in the future, almost certainly. It'd be very surprising if they did not do that. <laughs> Excuse me. So we've got a question here. Do you recommend protecting smaller shrubs and trees from egg laying? Uh, that is something you can do. So you can put down cloth or mesh to try to protect those trees from egg laying as uh, the insects really get rolling. Uh, I would primarily occupy yourself with your younger plants if you want to protect those. Your older plants should be able to weather it fairly well. Uh, but younger trees you might consider pr uh, protecting. And that actually leads me into the final part of what I'm going to be talking about here this evening, getting down to management. 
Um, a lot of folks are very worried, obviously, because we've we've seen large numbers of cicadas come up before. Maybe a few of your trees took damage. Um, generally, there is no management recommendation for these. They just don't do that much damage. Uh, unfortunately, some folks want to know how can we use pesticides to try to combat them. And what research has indicated is that in order for pesticide to be effective, you would have to apply it about every three to four days. That is not at all practical or reasonable when it comes in terms of money. I would not suggest using a pesticide at all when it comes to cicadas. What I would do is I would use planning. Um, we have lots of information at Purdue Extension and other places, other schools around the country that will talk about when these different cicada broods come up. And what I would do is I would simply plan around them for when you do your uh, younger tree planting, when you want to put in new additions, make sure you time it in a year where it's just not going to be as cicada heavy, so to speak. You know, if you see brood X is coming up in 2038, let's maybe think about planting trees another year. So we got a few other questions here. So how warm of soil do they emerge from? Um, I don't have an exact number on that one, Patty. I would guess the soil needs to be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That is generally a good ballpark figure for most insects. Um, however, keep in mind, they live in the soil year round. So they've adjusted to that soil temperature fairly well. Their bigger thing is they're going to be more concerned with the ambient air temperature. So the, it's basically as soon as the air temperature feels like it can support insect life on a from day to day, they're probably going to emerge. So in that one, you're looking at at least 60 degrees for the ambient air temperature, preferably 65 degrees. So would it be best to wait until fall to plant new trees? Um, yeah, I mean, you're 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 going to want to avoid planting trees while these cicadas are active. Honestly, what I would do is I would simply wait until the following year and see if you can uh, follow whatever recommendation for the planting practices are for whatever tree you're interested in. Um, remember, these guys, they're, some years you will have just a lot of cicadas, and it's going to be best to wait until for a year where it's going to be smaller so that way you don't have to worry quite as much about protecting your new trees. But again, you can also cover those trees with some kind of drop cloth to protect them against um, over position so that way they just don't take as much damage. Let's see, the news has been predicting that as cicada bodies rot, we will be left with a horrible smell. Is that true or false? Well, they do tend to smell when they die. Um, I would have expected that, say, during Brood X emergence, and I honestly didn't see it that much. But keep in mind, these are bugs. You could just get, you can always use a rake and clean them up. I mean, they're not going to be something nasty that's not safe to handle. They're just going to be a lot of nasty dead bugs. Cicadas do have a little bit of a smell, yes. Um, but I don't see this particular emergence being that bad. Um, is there a way to tell the Brood 13 and Brood 19 cicadas apart? Uh, the way we do that is their geography. So that's what I was talking about when I was telling you about what broods actually look like. So... Uh, where you're located at will tell you what brood you're actually dealing with right then. And then you can usually tell the line between them because they won't they won't emerge con uh, concurrently every year. So that way you can actually look at the different years they emerge, like 17 years from now, some entomologist is going to go, oh, hey, brood 19 came back up again. Um, and then 13 years from now, someone else is going to say, oh, brood 13 up again or what have you. Uh, that's how we dig. That is how we know. Uh, that's, that's how we tell the broods apart, is timing and geography. Let's see, can't you just dig their bodies into the ground? They shouldn't be harmful. So yes, I mean, you could do that. It's up to you. You can just bury them. I know a lot of folks will feed them to their chickens, etc. Okay, lots of questions. That's good. So I should say too, so after management here, that is actually the last of what I have as a part of the presentation this evening. This is also kind of the reason why I wanted to present this information to all of you tonight, because one of the things I do is I talk a lot about spotted lanternfly. So spotted lanternflies, their body, which you can actually see in front of you right now, they have the same body shape as a cicada. They're just much smaller. And I want you to be able to tell the difference between a cicada and a spotted lanternfly, because most likely you stand a really good chance of seeing both this year. And this way, you know what you're looking at. Spotted lanternfly, they're going to have those beige wings with black dots on them, whereas cicadas are going to be larger. They're going to have membranous wings. 
And that way you can just kind of enjoy the emergence too and listen to the trees sing a little bit. All right, so that is what I have part of the presentation. So for those of you watching on YouTube, thanks for watching and please feel free to put comments in the chat below and I will see you the next time.